Hello again. Our last speaker today is Adam Zadrozny. Now, Adam is an astrophysicist working at the National Center for Nuclear Research and lecturer of natural language processing at the University of Warsaw, both in Poland. As a PhD student, he was an intern at Facebook and later he got his PhD at the National Center for Nuclear Research. He took part in the first detection of gravitational waves during the International LIGO Virgo project. Subsequently, he was awarded the Copernicus Medal by the Polish Academy of Sciences and the Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. He completed his postdoc at the Center of Gravitational Wave Astrophysics at the University of Texas. Your turn, please. Okay, uh, so I would like to tell in my talk how we can use deep learning to hunt the optical counterparts to gravitational wave event. Well, apart from other talks, my talk would be a uh, focus on astronomy and usage of the AI in the astronomy on the example of, of the team that I work with. Okay, so if you think about the astronomy, you, you rather think about telescopes, you, you think about galaxies, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, what astronomer really see is a bunch of code and data that he need to process. So, so this this meme was quite accurate. What what exactly we do? Also, if we think about astronomy, we think about the beautiful uh, nebula that they are taken by the Hubble telescope. But truly, we we get the data, and from this data, we try to uh, find out something about the universe and basically if you are working with optical astronomy uh, you get two-dimensional arrays with uh, some pixels so so this is basically a two-dimensional table of uh, bytes and you try try to get get something from it well in the last years we we have a, a huge well boost forward in the observational ways of the universe in the last 50, 60 years. Basically, if we see the universe by some other instrument, we know we get some more knowledge about it. Well, the thing that we perfected uh, quite much is the astronomy of electromagnetic waves. So we have the telescope, we have the radio telescopes. Not so long time ago, we created uh, neutrino, de neutrino detectors and the cosmic ray detectors, which were much more sophisticated. This is the uh, 20th century when the optical astronomy is well, started from the very beginning. Uh, and from the 2015, we, uh, we learned to observe the universe in the gravitational waves. And this is something completely different, and this is a bit of, of a game changer. Uh, because we can observe universe uh, by observing the changes in the uh, space-time metric, a tiny changes in the in the in the space-time curvature that we can register. So we have uh, in 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 the on the on Earth we have three giant rulers which are gravitational wave detectors which measure how how the uh, space-time curvature changes, and we can see through these detectors. Events like uh, clashing, uh, colliding to neutron stars, colliding black holes, uh, or neutron star with black hole, we, we hope to see uh, the signals from rotating, uh, rotating uh, neutron stars or collapsing uh, very massive stars. Uh, but but this is something that that we will learn in the future. But right now we we using those those giant rulers we can. Uh, we, we, we try to, what, what we can register is the merging neutron stars or merging black holes. But what is important in this, in this picture, that merging of two neutron stars or neutron star with black hole could leave us with the electromagnetic signature. So we can see on the sky some kind of a, a new star that will fade depending on if, if it resulted with the short GRB or if it resulted with uh, with kilonova, it, it might be a, a seconds, minutes, or or days in case of kilonova. So it's it's not only that we that we 
currently we could only see the, the outcome of such a process like, like merging two neutron stars, Shoji-A B uh, and, and its afterglow. But here with the gravitational wave detectors, we can see how this pro process started because the gravitational wave will tell us how uh, how it started, so about some what well, is acceleration of the mass in the source, but electromagnetic waves will tell us something about the about the outcome. It would be especially uh, interesting if we can uh, detect supernova core collapse because we know we would know how the massive star uh, collapsed and how the process started. What, what was what was what was the engine that powered it up? But we hope to to register this signal in the next couple of years. But currently what most of my work focusing it foc is fo focusing is to search for the uh, optical counterparts to gravitational wave from uh, neutron star mergers or neutron star black hole mergers, so so-called kilonova and JRBs uh, afterglow. So basically I, I tell you that that those uh, those processes are very very short. It's something that appears in in, in and and fade might fade in the uh, matter of seconds or minutes or days. Usually, if we if we look on the star, we if if you go to Bieszczady or to Tatry to observe a good sky, you 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 will see that the sky almost does not change, and it's a bit unfortunate because just after our eyesight, what what we the the faintest stars that we can observe. Uh, the universe is is changing rapidly. There is a lot of processes that could change very fast, but we could not see it. Uh, we we need we had to develop telescopes to to to, uh, to to see this changing universe. This this was very this the telescope was a breakthrough in this in this case. So if for example here we have the the picture of the NGC nine nine three. And if if you can look on this animation in the matter of days from uh, August 22 to till August 28, the objects, the kilonova starts fading very very fast, but it appears in the in the matter of days. So so it was not. If we think about astronomy, we think about billions of years, millions of years. But here we have processes that 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 could happen in the matter of days. So this is something which is not. Not very aligned with what we what we learn in school. Well, the gamma ray burst. I I, I tell you that it was uh, the short gamma ray burst are the merging of two neutron stars. Ba basically, neutron star is a very compressed uh, star. It's something that that has 1.4 uh, solar mass, but it's compressed to the size of Wroclaw. So so basically, you can imagine how how dense the matter is. It's a very neutron rich. And basically, if those those two objects collide, and the last and this this collision process is uh, at the very end, it's very rapid. Uh, if so, it, then it forms a black hole and forms a jet, and eject a lot of neutron star rich matter, uh, neutron uh, neutron rich matter uh, around this this object, and also it forms a jet with the gamma rays. And there is uh, here we have one, the, the the most uh, the the most luminous one GRB, which uh, which afterglow could be seen even by the naked eye, but we registered only one of it, and we uh, like that bright, and we uh, studying the GRB since seventies. So so it's usually a very faint and very fast fading objects. The, the other, if you, there is also another type of GRBs, which is the long GRBs, and these long GRBs are the result of uh, st collapse of very massive star, and also we we have the jet there. Uh, this this is this is our hypothesis. This uh, this one is confirmed that at least in the sum of uh, some cases, it's a merging of two neutron stars. Uh, but the problem is. How to how to hunt uh, those GLBs? How to how to find if we if we have uh, information in LIGO which we which we had about thirty seconds prior to the to the merging of this neutron star that there will be a merge 
of neutron star in in our vicinity, which means 40 uh, megaparsecs, which translates to uh, 100, 120 million light years away. So quite close in the universe times. But just after the merging of two neutron stars, we observed the GRBs. This was the event GW170817. And then the, the other telescopes uh, joined and uh, start observing it into optical, uh, infrared, radio, and X-ray. We X-ray we catch at the very end. Uh, but the okay, so, so you, you might think, what, what is the problem with uh, with catching uh, catching such event? Problem is the localization because here, if we have only uh, two uh, gravitational wave detectors, we got a, a part of this uh, sphere. But when we have the three of three of them and the GRB satellite, which uh, registered the GRB, uh, GRB that were accompanying this event, we have still about forty square degrees to to search. But the problem is that the good telescope have a field of view of one square degree, and really good telescope which can look ver into very deep space have only a fraction of one square degree. And in this case, we are extremely lucky. Because otherwise, this area it's typically about few hundred square degrees, so you can imagine that searching for it is not easy. <coughs> Sorry, about this uh, about this event, uh, GW0817 was very special one because we it was first time when we observed the merging of two neutron stars in the gravitational waves, uh, first time that we could confirm that. Uh, colliding neutron stars really produce the short GRBs, uh, and we can confer we could confirm that the god in the in the universe uh, was created in the merging of two neutron stars. So if you have something which is which is god, uh, like like for example a ring on the finger, it means that it was a matter that was created in the uh, in the two neutron stars colliding. So there there was a plenty of science that we do on this event. Uh, so. And people were pretty enthusiastic, but up till now we we were able to observe in LIGO six neutron star mergings merger, neutron star mergers, but we only observed the EM counterpart once, and it was only the case when the localization was pretty good. So in other cases we are not so lucky in this case. Okay, so let's let's get to the to the what interests you probably the most. So uh, so so it. So we we need to wire the our algorithms that that need to help us with with this search because clear, clearly you you now see that we have the problem uh, with our apparatus. So we can have uh, some telescopes which 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 are observing the stars, and we need to find the optical tra transient faster than the other teams. Uh, because uh, who, who gets it faster, uh, the, the, the one who gets it faster will publish the most interesting, uh, more interesting publications. So this is, this is some kind of a, a run for it. And the problem is, okay, we, we, we got the, the, the alert from uh, LIGO, there is a possible measure of two neutron stars and we need to find a weak transients. So what we do? The, the first thing, oh, it's, it's near to the galaxy that we already seen. So we can, we, we take one image, which, which is taken the night of the alert, after the alert, and the one image that we have taken previously, and we just align those images, subtract, and then we uh, get something, a result of subtraction. Unfortunately, if, we, if you do so uh, using the, the multiple uh, algorithms, like for example, bramage zakai algorithm of subtraction, uh, alert Lupton, uh, then you got with a lot of artifacts. And those artifacts looks like a normal star, that there is, there is a difference, there was, here we, there we have nothing and here we have something. But unfortunately it might came from the atmospheric uh, fluctuations and other, other things. So what, what you do, you usually uh, try to construct the uh, the test uh, test set training set where, where you have the you compare two empty fields you compare the, some uh, field we, where, where you have the the optical transient or you have the injection so moved star on the on the reference image and uh, on the on the on the 
original image and then then you try to have the two sets uh, which which is one is connected with real thing and other one with it bogus and you and you try to use the uh, various machine learning models to to make the classifiers and basically in the in the Toros team what what we were using previously it was the random forest and we tried the the boosted decision trees uh, random forest and stuff like that uh, with support vector machine we are not so lucky and we we know what what we did wrong but but those random forests uh, is is pretty much the standard in the astronomy but those methods have the accuracy around 89% well you can see it's 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 good but when you have the hundreds of images and you and you are left with uh, uh, for human inspection with about uh, 50 from uh, from each which is which is good because it's it's not many it's uh, comparing to 10000 possible uh, but uh, 50 multiplied by 100 it's 5000 so it's not uh, not good anymore so what we do is to use the neural networks especially a cnn ones so convolutional neural networks and then we uh, use the the test and training set and what we uh, and we were very surprised when we just cut a, a piece of a picture which was 21 by 21 pixels that we got uh, around 99.5% so we were just down to the uh, to almost one per image that we need to investigate or two per image so so this was uh, this was really uh, interesting stuff our our first algorithm that we used for the uh, actual publication for with the CNN it was it was about 2 years ago and what was important here that we are trying to think okay what what was the problem with random forest and uh, the problem was that we we were using the uh, something which we called uh, source extractor uh, the program is called uh, short abbreviated as sextractor and basically it produces you a set of feature for each object find and this cut you a piece of information but if you only take from uh, from the source extraction process the position of of a uh, of of each suspected transient and then cut a piece of an image uh, then you don't lose the information you have all the original information and probably uh, because you if you take only features you cut cut a lot of important information in this case for example you don't know that there is a huge deep so you have the minus value after subtraction which means that it was that this is an artifact which humans would spot but the random forest have not a chance to do to do so so this 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 we published this in brass and if you look on the on the our uh, network it's it's pretty simple it's only uh, two convolutional layers uh, max pooling and dropout and and some dense layers at the end and some some dropouts but basically if you what was the key uh, important to get the high accuracy? It was manipulating the, those dropout values. Basically, it here you can you can take a five by five, three by three, but but basically the the, the dropouts were uh, most important to fine tune this this network. So so co we we get the improvement of about ten percent uh, comparing to the random forest methods here. Okay. But what we uh, can do if we do not have the reference image and the solution uh, compare the image from the different surveys and usually uh, what, what we what we do in the in the in the very uh, in the early days uh, when I was working it was that the PhD student was sitting with the with the suspected transient list and then go to the some survey images so telescope that scan, scan almost the half of the sky or uh, the, this hemisphere that it was located and then then compare it oh uh, there there is a star here oh we reject that it was taking a, a huge extreme long of uh, length of time uh, so but we can do that with using the neural nets the the, the main author of this uh, of this algorithm here was uh, is mrs katarzyna vardenga who was uh, doing her master thesis at the university of texas rio grande valley after under the supervision of so Mario Diaz and me and what what we can do in this case here we have the images 
of, taken from CTMO, which is the telescope located in Brownsville, and SDSS, which is the, 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 the survey that is located in Arizona. So you can see that those images are different. We need to, uh, but we can find the sources of on, on the on the both of images uh, using using our source uh, source extraction procedures, and we can see f f we can create the, some some transient and non transient uh, based on the in the real data, which is which is the data from uh, O two search. Uh, from the previous paper that that I was showing you, and there is a non-transient simulated data. So those simulations are more or less accurate. Uh, this is the, this was the this was the the training uh, training uh, set on on the uh, for the previous algorithm. So th this real data. Okay, so we we started with two pol uh, two topologies uh, for the neural net. One is it was based on the CNN, so we have uh, as an input we we put a two uh, three dimensional arrays with 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 the layers, which was one it, it was the CTMO image, the other one was SDSS image, and we have the uh, convolutional layer, max pooling layers, and and dropout layer. At the end, we we end up with dense dense layers, and the other one was a. Uh, a bit different topology where the CTMO uh, and SDSS image were put through the set of dense uh, layers. Then we get uh, then we do the concatenate, and then we get the dense uh, dense layers. There is there is no dropout here, and the network was doing some errors. Basically, here we have. Uh, uh, some errors which were not recognized as a transient or was falsely recognized as a transient due to misalign of the stars. Uh, some some other uh, this this were the, the errors for the CNN model. That was the typical for the dense model. But the result that we that we obtain using uh, training on ten thousand samples, the CNN model predicted correctly the transient in. Uh, 98% of cases. The dense layer was a bit worse. It was 97% of cases. So the accu accuracy in this case was was pretty high. And the main error is was classifying uh, of the non-transient. So uh, basically, the network tend to uh, classify non-transient as a transient. So so we got uh, quite many false positives. But it is much better than if we need to wait about a day or at least a few hours for a reference image. We can do it on the spot, and we can, thanks to this algorithm, we can do a localization of potential optical transient connected with gravitational wave event almost on the spot. So, so basically, we, we take the image, we process it, and in a few minutes, we have the potential optical transient candidates. Which which would be a, a, a big step forward in this uh, for for our team. Going to the to the end, basically, uh, what is important to mention that if we are doing a time domain astronomy, we are not doing the exposition of, of the image for a few uh, hours, but we are do taking the images every ten seconds. This is this is from the Pi of the Sky team, which which was the uh, Polish team that, that was a precursor in many many of the methods uh, for online anal image analysis. Uh, those those systems were taking images every ten seconds, uh, which means that uh, number of data data that you get uh, during the night it was thirty gigabytes for us. Well, it's it's not a problem, but this was the number of uh, data that you that you were taking in the. Uh, 2007 so so it was and and 2008 so it was not so the, the hard drives were not so big at that time uh, well what was the funny thing was that at some point the the switch was saturated and it was a gigabyte gigabit switch that we're using by this observatory uh, so so this is so more observation you you do more data you get and this was the the gigabyte or uh, gigabyte per per nights and few gigabytes per hour uh, but here we we have the, the another project that it's uh, it's LSST project which which is made by international consortium ma mainly f the universities from United States, but uh, here you get a few terabytes 
uh, per night in the LSSD. So, so in fact, uh, you you get the 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 full catalog, and only catalog, not images. Uh, after uh, fifteen years of operation of this telescope, would be uh, uh, at at least fifteen petabytes. Uh, but with the images, it would be all, almost uh, a half of exabyte. So, so the huge data centers would be would be needed for this project. So, basically, what what I would like to uh, tell you that uh, in the time domain astronomy, a good algorithm might might be helpful. You 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 are also not not only limited by hardware, but also the algorithm uh, plays the key issue. The other thing is that. Very simple uh, neural neural nets might be very helpful comparing to the machine learning models. Those models are very robust. If we try to make the model more complicated, it would not work so fast, and we uh, and it it was not always get, giving us the better results. In astronomy, the peta scale is al uh, almost here, but the exa scale is approaching quite fast, and. Last but not least, the astronomy uh, might be a place where the most extreme big data meets with AI. Basically, okay, you, you might think that the, the Facebook or, or Google data is uh, it's the, the most, the biggest uh, data sources that if you think about big data, it's, it's the place that you, that you put it. But here in astronomy, if, we, if you process the, in, in, in Google or in Facebook, you do not work on whole data. You usually work on the small fraction of it, but here in the preparing the catalogs with the LSST, which will be a, a few years in the future, we, you, you make the research on the whole data set. So this might be a place where the extreme big data meets AI. So basically with, with our telescopes and with our algorithms, we, we try, to, try to understand the uh, universe a little bit more. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm awaiting your questions. Thanks. Adam Zadrożny on deep learning and gravitational waves. Adam, thank you very much indeed.